I'm John Wilson. Welcome to Owned and Operated. Twice a week, we talk about home service businesses. And if you're a home service entrepreneur, then this is going to be the show for you. We talk about our own business in residential plumbing, HVAC, and electric. And we also talk about business models that we just find interesting. Let's get into it. If you're a home service entrepreneur that's just starting out, or is early on in the journey and you haven't broken the $5 million revenue mark, we've got an event for you. This spring in Cleveland, March 19th to the 21st, we're hosting an event at my office. It's going to be awesome. Honestly, some of the most impactful visits of my career have been visits to companies that were larger than we were that we could take lessons from and see how they're doing stuff. Like get a behind the scenes look. How are they structuring warehouse? How are they thinking about call center? Can I talk to their managers? Can I understand what their KPIs are? We're going to dive into all that stuff. We are here to help people get above $5 million in revenue. So join us in Akron, Ohio, March 19th to the 21st for a breaking $5 million event. Love to see you there. Details are at ownedandoperated.com. Today on Own and Operated, Jack and I talk capacity. Capacity is the maximum amount that something can hold. So how do you fill your schedule and how do you think about maximizing the dollars that come out of your team every day in service, sales, and install? It's a big conversation, has big lasting effects all the way from 1 million in sales to 100 million in sales. So it's something to attempt to get right as early as possible. It's a great episode. I know I enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome back to Own Day and Operated. Yeah, we're diving back in. We're diving deep. So as you and I were talking about what to talk about, I came up with a topic. You were like, no, that doesn't sound like a good topic. And then you couldn't come up with a reason why, which is great. I was going (laughs) to catch 20 or like a devil's advocate. And then I went, this is actually a good conversation. So, yeah. So the conversation, we originally started with optimizing schedule. And I don't even know if that's the right way to put it. So I think that potentially the right way to put it is dispatching method, either that or like capacity, which is loaded. That's probably accurate. It's capacity and how to deal with capacity. Yeah. So capacity, I'll give my spiel and I hope it turns into a good conversation because I think that this will be helpful and I want to be challenged so I can get better at it. So capacity is the maximum amount that something can carry or hold, right? That's capacity. Very dictionary of me today. So when we're thinking about capacity, like what we sell is time and expertise. However it is that we frame that, we're problem solvers, we're all that stuff, but really we're selling time and we're selling like the expertise of someone that we have out there. And our job is to fill capacity. And the way we think about filling capacity is as if I have someone for eight hours, we want them to be working hands on the tools as much of those eight hours as possible. Now, inside HVAC and plumbing, the utilization rate, which is how many hours on the tools will your people have for service is 40%, which is like crazy, right? Is that roughly what you guys see in your business? This was actually where I was going to go with my comment on it is, are you talking about like, what did they call it? Worked hours or that's not the correct term. You can just call it wrench time. Like how much of your time is wrench time? So like physically turning wrenches. So capacity is two different things. One is on the service side. Is their schedule full? Do they have enough leads? Mm -hmm. How good is the routing? And how much of their time is wrench time? So that's service. Capacity is in install is did we fill their day? And how we think about those two different things is important because in service, you're feeding leads to sales and in sales, fills install schedule. So when you're going to fill capacity, you have to make a decision for service and it's a conscious decision. I encourage everyone to like think through thoroughly is what dispatching method you're going to choose. So I've got my fingers up, but like on one side, let's call it one and over here is five. So there's basically two polar opposites with dispatching. So over here, over by one is route based. So in our last episode, we just talked about uh, pool service company. Pool service companies is like very route based. It's a low dollar job and your job is to put as many homes and pools into that route as possible. Efficiency is the name yeah. of the game. Over here on five is dollars. And these are counter goals. Typically, the more route focused you're going to get, 
the less dollars you're dealing with. You're dealing with these $80, $100 services. You're not dealing with opportunity. The way you have to think about dispatching is where in that one to five am I going to be? Like what works the best for my business? Am I going to be totally route-based? And that's the way we do things. Some HVAC companies work really well that way. The problem is they usually put the wrong guy on the job because it's not dollars-based. So they'll be like, you run 10 tune-ups in this neighborhood, but you're also the worst equipment flipper that we have, right? Whereas dollar-based is you're the best equipment flipper that we have, but you only run four to five calls a day and you might drive 45 minutes in between them. And the balance is somewhere in between them. I'm smiling because you put it very eloquently, but this is something that we deal with and we didn't think about it from that perspective, but it really is those two yes. separate points. There are we... two totally counter points to dispatch and you need to decide which is the right one for your business. And then we juxtapose it based on where, because I don't know how other people do it, but we dispatch from home too. So we dispatch yeah. text based on their location. Yep. And so we have text in a 60 mile service area radius around Nashville, right? We have some texts that are closer to initial jobs, the first jobs of the day. So you don't want them driving 60 miles to get to the other end of the spectrum. Yeah. But if the call is good enough, we will send the best tech over to there. So it is yeah. a balance between opportunity of sale, how old the unit, and that takes a bunch of work on the back end, right? So it's easy to say that, but there's so much that goes into it. There's recognizing age of equipment, collecting data on age yep. of equipment. Is it a maintenance? Is it a service? Hey, this is an estimate. Like I need new equipment come out now. And so I don't know where we are on that spectrum, to be honest with you. Yeah. That's something I haven't, like, I need to chew on that a little bit because that's an interesting perspective on like, yes. where do you sit on there? I yeah. think we tend to sit more opportunity based as a smaller company. I'm less concerned about wasted drive time if we can get it back with a big sale. But maybe that's me being blind a little bit. And so maybe, you know. Maybe. So resolving dispatch method is something that should get handled pretty early on in your business because it has to become an intentional part of how you grow. And I don't know that there's a right or a wrong way, honestly. I well, think it's just the, like what works for you. Yeah, the more interesting part. So as we set up like multiple locations and specifically GMVs, we utilize our route specificity leading to that one route side to pinpoint locations where we are going to either rent shop space to create a GMV or try to drive additional traffic in that area. One, because it's closer to our techs. And then we have other GMBs that are located in areas that we want to pick up because it's more lucrative because it's a higher medium average income in that location. Yeah. So we're trying to play both fields at the moment. And now you're giving me an existential crisis. I feel like now I need to be more intentional about yes. where we're going to sit and how that's going to look moving forward. A hundred percent. I think the important things to say here is it's a one and a five, as in there's still a two, three, and a four yeah. in there. So we are solidly 80% dollar-based, like profit dispatching mm -hmm. versus route dispatching. But it's probably easier to not have a clear direction when the team is smaller and you can like dictate the schedule a little bit more. But as you grow with more and more dispatchers, they need very clear direction on yeah. what does winning look like for them? Because they're the ones that dispatch. They control the route. So are they driving for dollars, even though it's less calls? Or are they driving for efficiency so that they can knock out more calls? Again, I think it's mainly just how the business works. I think it also if depends every... your geolocation too, right? So to take it sure. one step further, the other conversation I have a lot with other owners as well as my team is whether you're buying in an area or whether you're growing into an area, would you rather be a small fish in a big pond or the big fish in a small pond? Personally, you're going to answer. In a I second. would rather be the big fish in the big pond. <laughs> yeah, that's the best option. But for a smaller, medium sized business that's growing or you're acquiring, like the big fish in the big pond is the $200 million giant that's down the road. But unfortunately, I can't be Hoffman at the moment. Soon. Soon. Maybe eight years. We'll see. Yeah. Point being though, is when you grow into a small pond, geographically, they tend to be smaller cities. And so it could be one way or the other, depending on how dense the population is of that small pond, right? 
That's a, it's a crazy one. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. I think it's dependent on the business. We have an answer. I think the biggest thing is pick which side of that spectrum you're on. Communicate that throughout your team because it really does drive the ship. Yeah. On the and, other side of it, if you were a property manager maintenance company that was really working on tight margins, then you would be completely on that one side. You say, hey, we make totally. razor thin margins, but we have huge volume. We need to be as efficient as possible on our drive time. And then you yeah. have companies that are like, hey, we need to capitalize. We're not going to do any of those commercial you no know, cuts, no anything yeah. like that. Full residential, how do we maximize our dollar amount per job? Yeah. So I think you can see property management is a good one on one side. The other one is like a roto router in plumbing where they will send a technician on a two-hour drive to go potentially do any call that they think could turn into opportunity. So mm -hmm. like around here, when we get people from roto router we frequently get stories that they went from Akron or Cleveland to Toledo, which is like a full two, two and a half hours. And that's a big part of it is like they're commission only. So the company doesn't have a ton to lose. And they go out there and they like replace a toilet flapper. And they're just like, what did I just do? So that's the other side of the spectrum. Full opportunity based company has nothing to lose. But they put all the risk onto the employee. So on service, pick where you are. And we got onto that because we're back on capacity, right? So Mm -hmm. What determines your capacity and service is your dispatching method. Because if you're running the number one, the route-based dispatching method, you can do more. You can do 10 to 12 HVAC tune-ups a day if they only take you 20 minutes and you just walk from one to the next. But we'll talk to people and they're in recruiting and they're like, how many tune-ups do you do a day? And we're like four to five. And they're like, how on earth does that work? And it's like, we dispatch totally differently than how you're used to being dispatched. It is just a different set of rules here. Because we're on the other side of the spectrum. So they're doing much more volume. But usually when I find companies that are over on this route sized type business, they don't normally have a great sales process. So they do tend to make all their money in efficiency, not in the sale. Whereas we make all of our money in the sale. Yeah, that's interesting. Because that permeates through the whole company too. Because your volume has to be there. And your customer acquisition cost has to be incredibly low to be able to maximize. If you have great efficiency, it doesn't matter if you're not, one, making that money because you don't have enough customers. So you have to have a really good lead gen system. It steers the ship. See, I was thinking maybe you'd find that more in kind of a franchise model, but you'd probably find that more cost driven, price driven. So the larger the company, you typically find what's called dispatching for profits, which yeah. is a four or a five. That's what we run. John, where'd you come up with this one to five scale? Is this like a next star thing that you ripped off? Honestly, or? this is John's head. This is something I made it's up a, a couple framework. years ago because I think people unintentionally dispatch and you got to pick a lane. And if for no other reason than to give clarity to your team. So someone's going to start and they need to know, am I route based or am I dollars based? Now that said, different teams could be different things. Like our septic business is route based. That's mm -hmm. not opportunity. That's a $300 thing, no matter how far we have to drive. So we might as well not drive far. Sometimes you have both, but most of our business is opportunity-based. All that said, that really determines how yeah. you feel capacity. So what that looks like for us is we might have an extra couple guys than another HVAC company. So if I'm talking to an HVAC company, they could be like, dude, we do 10 tune-ups a day, blah, blah, blah. But maybe they're tiny because all their money is made from tune-ups and not installs. Whereas that one guy, you know, it takes me two guys to do that one guy's output of tune-ups because of how we route. Now, the dream scenario is you get a very tight geographic area that you run somewhat of a route-based and dollar-based dispatching model. So that is a goal for us right now. We're splitting our service area into zones and we're tightening our zones up. So we're trying to get 50% of our revenue in zones one and two. So that's been a really big push for us so that we can both drive dollars and efficiency. But it's taken us years to be able to even think about getting there. Yeah, I was going to say, not to go down another rabbit hole, but how are you determining zones? Is that another gross or a medium income question? Or it's, it's a couple different things. It's proximity to our office. What is routing time? That makes sense. And then inside routing time, what's the average age of the home? What's the average household income? What's the average age and what's the population of that zip code? Okay. None of it's rocket science, but we're trying to, like, as we're blowing up our marketing, we are intentionally choosing zones. So that's really all this is. And you basically said the same thing. Hey, if we're putting a GMB in this area, I want to make sure that we like grow more in that area. We're doing the same thing. We're just carpet bombing it. 
hey, you're going to get postcards, you're going to get TV, we're going to follow you around on Meta, you're going to see our trucks everywhere because we're going to be all up in your business. So what we hope this does is we hope that every single service tech, instead of four calls a day, will now be able to run five, which is a 25% jump in potential opportunities, which as I shared with you, we have more than enough leads to do that with the existing team and not change anything. Hey, this episode is sponsored by Service Scalers. So Service Scalers is actually a brand that I've used personally with our companies for a little bit over a year now. They've helped us manage our digital advertising. Frankly, they did a lot better than our last agency. Leads went through the roof and cost per click went way down. Check out Service Scalers if you're a plumbing, HVAC, or electrical home service company. That's what they knock out of the park and they did a great job for me. That was my next question, actually, with capacity, right? Is you're talking about how many, your lead flow is there. You have it, you know, that's the first step. The second yep. step is as it comes in, how do you hire to manage the amount of leads that you have? You know, there's the three-day dispatch board. Are you utilizing that or what method are you utilizing to say, hey, we have enough people or we have too many people? How far out are you trying to be booked? Well, what does that look yeah. like? So we try to be booked out like same day, next day for install. We want yeah. to be able to get stuff done quick. So sometimes we do that. Sometimes we don't. We usually, if we sell something, we have the opportunity to do it tomorrow. So that is important to us. And then in service, we usually try to be three, two, one. So three three two, calls one. tomorrow, yeah. two calls the day after that, one call the day after that. So we want to be able to have room for opportunity, but not go into the day with an empty schedule. Yeah, I think that's the key. That's what we started utilizing as well. And that's how our outbound is. What time do you start? You said your, your guys start outbounding at, or your call team starts outbounding at two. They go into code red. This is a longer conversation. <laughs> okay. No, let's not get into it then. <laughs> We've talked in call center before. I'd hate to drive it back there. If we're allowed to run free, it'll be call center and uh, septic. It'd be call center and septic <laughs> and lead flow like all yeah. day long. But yeah, so dispatching method steers the capacity train. So that's how it works on service. So on the install side, the way to think about capacity, and this is something we're working on now, we badly sell install. So we're actively tightening this up right now. We'll sell a six hour project. The problem with a six hour project is you lost two hours because you're not going to do a two hour project on top of that. We're dividing our install now up into half days and full days. And that's the big change that we're making there. And we expect revenue to jump, which should be good because we're going to be more efficient and we're going to fill our capacity better. But usually what we've historically told people is if we have installers going home before 2 p.m., that was a failure of dispatch. We did not fill their board to capacity. We either missold it or we didn't have something that they could go float in on really quick to get done because we're really caring about per day revenue per install team. And so do your installers, they do the big installs, right? They're doing new units, they're doing packages, yep. and splits. What kind of things are they floating in on? Are they floating in on blower wheel changes, board changes, duct cleaning? What's that float look like? All our installers do is install. So all they do is install new units? Yes. Okay. So then, I mean, if they go home at two or one thirty, you're saying that capacity was missed because they should have sold their package to keep them there till five. No. So HVAC, what I would expect is like, is there a callback to run? So that way that callback doesn't mess up a full day tomorrow. I see. Yeah. In the other trades, it's probably a little bit more obvious mm -hmm. than HVAC, where there likely is something that we could do for an hour or two hours at yeah. the end of the day if we had a five hour project. Yeah. So I we mean, probably could it's mostly recall based. Or like, not even recall, but second visit. Like they have to go do one thing that they couldn't do in that first. Someone has to go back for an hour. We don't want to ruin a whole $3,000 day of revenue for that crew. So can we slide it in now? Okay. And then, so you're talking about a lot of capacity from like an install perspective or from a board perspective, but from a hiring perspective, do you have a framework on, I guess you kind of answered that. I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around, like once you get your lead gen down and lead gen and incoming, then it's less of an issue because you can throttle that. I guess my problem that I'm having right now is when you're so much smaller, maybe that's what you can speak on is when you're about two to $3 million range. Yeah. One, adding another tech to the team is difficult because you're adding another head count, but you don't have the leads to necessarily fill them up yet. And so your scale, right? Your one to five kind of fluctuates in and out as you hire a new personnel and you fill up their schedule with whatever, just because you want them to work. And then as they kind of your business build and then they fill up, then you can get back to this four or five. 
Do you follow me? Yeah, that's roughly how we think about it too. So I think the numbers might be a little different. We think about it a little bit less now than we used to. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we currently are blessed to have a wonderful amount of leads. So when we bring on a new tech, we could basically bring on a new tech anytime we want. But we also built it like that because I told the team, and I've said it here, there's no safe word for recruitment. We are going to continue hiring. Yeah. So that means leads always have to grow, which I showed you my chart. That's exactly what's happening. Leads always have to go up because we will always be bringing on new people. Mm -hmm. And we've basically held true to that where every Monday, three to five people start. So that's what we're here to do. I think when you're smaller, the way we think about staffing, I still use this metric a little. I used it today with electrical service. So we were looking at some hires and we had a really great shadow the other day and we're going to offer. And when we went to make that offer, the first thing we did was what does lead flow look like in that department? Now, we're not thinking of that or having that conversation as a let's not hire this person. We're thinking about that as a how do we level up our lead flow to be ready for this person? And we call it activating. If I hire a new tech today and he starts on Monday, I have two weeks of training. He's going to come on. He's going to ride along with somebody. He's going to learn Service Titan. He's going to learn the flat rate price book. He's going to onboard, do all of our HR and manager training, all that stuff. And that takes two weeks. So on his 11th day of work, he is going to be up and running in his own truck. Sometimes they beat that, but it's uncommon. We did have somebody beat that the other day. It shocks the system though. Because what that does is it gives our marketing team, it's okay if you don't have a marketing team, if you're doing it, it doesn't matter. It's just, that's how we communicate about it. It gives our marketing team two weeks to drive more leads. So maybe so, those leads are like, hey, okay, now our minimum call goal for plumbing is no longer 125 appointments a day. Now it's 130 because I have to fill this additional person. So how are we going to find those five extra calls? All right, are we going to outbound more with an ISR? Are we going to run additional 50 emails so that we can hopefully convert a few more of those opportunities? Yeah. Are we going to increase PPC? Are we going to increase LSA? It's all the same math that you guys are doing. We're just a little bit more deliberate about it. So mm -hmm. I have this person starting. I have to fill their schedule and they activate. That's the term we use. They activate in two weeks and they need 20 calls that week to be at full capacity. So you have a two weeks heads up that they need 20 calls. And sometimes that's been challenging, but honestly, not that challenging. Not really. Like at the end of the day, it's usually just money. Yeah, you just start putting additional funds into PPC LSA and you probably right. could do that. And then you back those off later as you can and you fill it in with whatever is more efficient on a cost per lead basis. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. That's what we did for plumbing is once we dried up all of our in-house initial, we just started cranking up the dial on PPC for plumbing. And right. right today it's higher than our HVAC budget, but hopefully one day we'll be able to throttle it back once plumbing for our company kind of kicks in. So it's the same yeah. idea, I think, in the long run. I still think that we're going to be intentional about, like, I, I wouldn't want to go out there and hire 10 plumbers tomorrow and then just dump a bunch of money in it. No, that's challenging. But we have hired three or four at a time in those teams, mm -hmm. right? So, like, those teams aren't necessarily huge. So, like, electrical service right now, it's six people. So one person is a lot. If they only need 24 calls a day, I'm adding an additional four calls to that that I would need. So that's a lot percentage-wise. Yeah. That said, it's still doable. And I think if you build the on-ramp for what it looks like to activate a new tech and fill their capacity, it becomes a little bit more approachable. And that's a little bit of a mix of proactive and reactive marketing. Like, do we bump up LSAs? Do we send some postcards? Postcards take two weeks. We yeah. design it, then you print it, then you ship it. So can we do that in enough time to be effective? Can you ramp? Yeah, PPC. Can you send emails? Just like figuring out what levers to pull. I think that's the real driver. But what I would encourage people to do, and I'm saying this as much to anyone listening as I am to myself, I know I even said it on this show. It's such a natural tendency. I said, hey, we're thinking about turning off LSAs. That would be fun, right? What I'm about to encourage people to do, and I need the taste of my own medicine, I challenge you not to turn it off and just to go hire somebody else. Yes. I think you get in this place of comfort where you ignore the clear signs. So almost every week we set a record call goal. Like we have more calls than the week before, except for Thanksgiving week. Yeah, you, that was a big dip because yeah. you know, Thanksgiving. <laughs> but like that has been our reality for six months. And even with that being our reality and knowing that this week is going to be more than last week and next week is going to be more than this week, 
I still find myself thinking, oh, okay, let's slow down ads instead of pushing to we have enough, we need to keep going. I was going to say, you have mentioned that to me multiple times that you're either going to not turn on ads or you're going to shut down ads. I know. I have to catch myself. It's a problem to have too. It's a wild problem and I can't believe that we have it, which is cool. I really can't. Yeah. So back to capacity, that's how you view capacity. And you actually answered my initial question. So my initial question that I was going to devil's advocate with you was, honestly, at what size do you worry about capacity or what size do you worry about sending them to this or this? Because I think before you, and this is speaking from our size right now, you're drawing so many different directions that capacity is one of the last things I think that's on your mind. And that being said, it's not, you know, we are just unintentionally working around it. And so to be more intentional with it is the, the driver there. Be more intentional and realize that you are dealing with capacity on the daily, whether you like it or not, and focus on really creating those SOPs and deciding what your business is and what it's going to look like. Yeah. And it affects a lot that go down the line, like even decisions like, am I going to run four calls or eight for tune-ups in HVAC? That is a dispatching decision. For what my time window is going to be. I know we've had this conversation, not on here yep. before. But are we going to run a two-hour time frame or a four-hour time frame? Or just no, yep. there's no time. I know there's certain people who love this where you don't run two-hour time slots. We don't run any time slots. And that still blows my mind to this day. Yeah, we're on no time slots now, but it's still pretty new. So I don't have much to say about it. Um, but yeah, picking dispatch method decides a lot for your business. It decides pricing because it's time mm -hmm. on the tools. It decides routing. It decides how many calls a day, which again determines pricing and then goes right into staffing. Because if you have 10 leads a day to run and you're only, that's one person or that's two, you got to pick which one that is and you need a good reason for why. But yeah, it ripples down. Think about capacity. It affects most of what you do and you might not be thinking about it, which is okay. And honestly, capacity, I think probably the big lesson is if you can get a hold of capacity, the earlier, the better. So we're 140 some people. We're about to break that 2 million a month. I think January is going to be our first 2 million month, which is crazy. And we're just getting our arms around capacity. And I'm sure in a year, I'll look back and be like, I didn't have my arms around capacity. Yeah, I thought I did. Yeah, I thought I did. Because yeah. a year ago, I probably thought I did too. I probably thought it was pretty good. But now that I'm looking, I'm like, man, there's a gap here. And the gap between where we are and where I think we could be is a 20% revenue jump. That's not a small revenue jump. We're probably going to implement that in December. And that is going to be what crosses us in the 2 million mm -hmm. a month range. This decision of capacity. That's how freaking real this thing is. So can we add that fifth call because we market tighter? And can we sell half day, full days and in install so that we don't lose an hour across every install team for sold hours? And, and those two tight. decisions will likely add 20% revenue. And can we hire instead of turn off LSA? Yeah, I got challenged on that today, which was good. We sent out three offers today for more technicians. And like every time it's like, oh man, can we keep them busy? And it's like, no, one, we can. Like I did more phone calls last week than in the entire month of August. I can keep these boys busy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's yeah. awesome. It's crazy. But yeah, good conversation, capacity. So affects a lot of decisions, get intentional around it. Decide how you want to handle it because it determines your dispatching, your pricing, and your staffing. So obviously three big important things. Thanks for tuning in today. This was a solid episode. I feel like we did good. good um, yeah. All right. Twice a week, Tuesday and Thursdays, we are dropping bombs all up on Apple and Spotify and wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Please make sure you give us a five star. Make sure you follow or hit subscribe. And thanks for tuning in. Thanks all. Thanks for tuning in to Owned and Operated, the podcast for home service entrepreneurs. If you enjoyed today's episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to cover, feel free to reach out. You can find me on Twitter at, at Wilson Companies. I'll see you next time.